And these mics really only pick up us. So, so if you ask a question, we're going to repeat the question and then answer the question. Hey, good morning. Welcome to National Flooring Equipment's uh, Surface Preparation Training. Uh, this morning, uh, our first session is going to be over small spaces, residential. Um, my name is Dave Bigham. I'm the Global Director of Training, which is uh, fancy for the guy that gets dirty. Um, joining me today in this training is going to be Tom. Tom, will you introduce yourself? Hey, good morning. My name is Tom Griffin. I am the International Sales Manager here at National, uh, and I also cover Colorado. So if you are out there watching from the beautiful state that we're in right now, I'm your guy. And so everybody knows this is a hybrid training, so we actually have um, customers here, and we are going to run equipment. They're going to hopefully touch and run some equipment. So um, we've got people joined in live, watching us live, and we obviously have a studio audience. Um, for running the equipment, let's just go over some quick safety. We know how to run the equipment. We'll start it off, we'll run it, but we encourage you guys to jump up here and please get behind and touch something. We know how to run the equipment, so this is a really great opportunity for you guys to get the feel for something that you might not otherwise get to. Um, if you can, if you have um, some kind of condition that won't allow you to run a grinder or push a shot blaster, please don't. Um, safety first. We have lots of safety gear. We have earplugs. We have safety glasses. Um, we have all that. If you guys need it, feel free. We'll provide it. Um, but this really is a hands-on training that we do. Um, we're actually, for the guys uh, online, we are in Denver, Colorado. Um, this is our training, uh, National Training Center here. And our manufacturer facility is located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And for all you guys out there online, uh, your questions are just as important to us. So uh, if you're on YouTube live, chat them in. Uh, you can email them to your RSM, get them to us however you want. We want to make sure to answer them. Uh, and the same for you guys. Um, we told everybody that's here in the building with us, if they ask a question, we're going to repeat it so that you guys can hear it, uh, but then also answer the question. Yeah, so uh, you guys don't have to wait um, for me to stop talking because that may never happen. According to my wife, she says if I got paid by the word, um, we'd be multimillionaires. Um, so don't wait till I'm done talking. Just raise your hand and interrupt. Um, because I might not get to it, so don't wait for me to get to it. If you have a question, feel free to ask at any time during the uh, production. Thanks for joining us. Um, let's talk a little bit about small spaces. We say small spaces, we're talking garages, we're talking residential, um, back porches, kitchens. Um, uh, in my previous life, I lived in Oklahoma in a house that was slab on grade and I grind and polished and stained every room in my house one room at a time because I couldn't move out. And my selection of equipment for that was really important because I did not live in uh, a giant mansion. Um, Robin Leach was not in my driveway going, these are the lifestyles of the rich and famous. I had chickens in my backyard, so my kitchen was small. My living room was small. The bedrooms were, you know, average, small size. So. We're going to talk a lot about um, how to choose your equipment, what's the right piece of equipment that fits in small spaces and residential. We're going to talk a little bit about um, why one machine's better than another machine, why you choose this machine over this machine. Um, is it access, accessibility? Is it production? Um, is it power requirements? Um, we make 480 volt grinders, um, not real convenient to um, grind a two-car garage with a gigantic 1,000-pound, 480-volt three-phase grinder. Maybe a 110-volt uh, planetary grinder um, would be a better selection to um, finish what uh, a small space like that in a, in, a, in a short amount of time. We're also going to talk about managing your customer's expectations. It is my personal favorite topic that I think over my career in this industry I think contractors fail at pretty bad on a regular basis. And I'm not throwing rocks at you guys, but a lot of times contractors show up, they bid a job, and then they show up to do it, but they have not managed their, 
their customers' expectations with how long it's going to take, what power is going to be available, uh, accessibility, um, noise, dust, all kinds of things that get overlooked that I think um, you guys can improve on. And when we're done with this, I'm going to wrap up with how to finish with your customer and manage their expectations, which is where I see the biggest failure. Not so much that you guys don't bring the right equipment to finish a job, but how you handle your customers and how you communicate with them. And believe it or not, when I'm done, you're going to be like, wow, I think he's right. Um, so stand by for that. Um, Tom, uh, we, we have a lot of customers that do a lot of different things here uh, in person and online. So once again, I just want to reiterate, if you guys have questions, chime in. Tom, you have anything to add or do you want to start with uh, some small machines? I think we could start with some small machines. Uh, something we're also going to cover later is accessing the job site. Uh, homes, small offices, uh, they all have you know, different obstacles to getting machines onto the job site. I mean, I don't know about everyone else's home, but I've got a couple steps up to my front door. Uh, my driveway has sunk. So I now have a nice three inch gap between my driveway and the slab that's in my garage. Uh, so good luck getting a grinder or one of our walk behinds over that. So we're gonna talk about getting all of this equipment on and off of the job site later. And then uh, I think also the value in the different tooling because while these machines are great for small spaces and we're gonna talk about those differences, the tooling that you put on them, whether it's a grinder or one of our scrapers is just as important um, to make those machines function. Perfect. You guys make yourselves at home. You guys can pull a chair up. You can sit down at the table. Um, sorry for you guys online, but there is coffee, donuts, um, fruit. Um, the double door refrigerator has every kind of drink you can imagine. There's water in the cooler on the other side of the table. So please make yourselves at home. Um, thanks for joining us. We're really glad you guys are here. It's, we used to have 50 or 60 people attend these trainings and then the world kind of came to a stop. So we're slowly coming back into this. It makes me really happy that you guys are here because I'd much rather talk to you guys than talk to a camera. Um, no offense, but I'm not a movie star. Obviously, you guys can tell by my looks. Hopefully, everybody's tuning in for my knowledge, not for my looks. But it's great to have someone to actually talk to in person. And it's, it's still good to have the opportunity for someone that can't make it here because of travel restrictions to learn something. Um, Tom, you want to start with like the smallest tooling and kind of maybe work our way up a little yeah. bit? Let's um, keep in mind, you guys, if we're going to start with some pretty small hand tools, but these are also considered companion tools for some of your larger grinders. Um, even your smaller grinders that are 110 volt or your walk behinds, there's going to be some places that you can't access those machines to behind pipes, behind toilets, um, behind um, reception desks that like don't move that are um, permanent. Um, Closets, um, real super narrow hallways. Stairs in a stairs. garage. So we're going to start with some small, small, small tools. Kind of talk about how that they can help you finish a job or access and prep a really small area. Do you want to move the table or do uh, you want to stay here? Do you want us to move the table out moving there? Moving the table up would probably All be right, easier. Cool. And Lift. <gasps> Lift with your knees. Just put your back into it. It's not the tuba. All right. So obviously dust control, we feel is super important in this industry. So most of the tools we're showing, not every single one, is going to have a shroud on it. And I personally prefer the convertible shrouds. So if I'm working out in a wide open area, I can close the shroud. And if I am working along the edges, I can flip it up so I can basically touch the wall with 100% um, prep to the very edge. Also getting into corners, like Tom mentioned already, stairs. So these are invaluable little tools. Um, a lot of guys like the smaller grinders for stairs um, where they have to hold a grinder at an angle or up off the ground because the seven inch grinder, this is a pretty heavy tool. So um, if you ever had to hold it up or try to do stairs, the stair fronts or stair tops, matter of fact, 
Uh, we have a guy here with me that was talking about doing some stairs in a garage that accessed the house where they had coated it previously. And he was actually prepared. I was super impressed. He had small hand grinders with shrouds on them so he could work the front of the stairs, the flat part of the stairs, and he could do a complete monolithic floor. It was, uh, it was, it was great. That's really impressive, actually. <laughs> uh, what about the corners on a stair? Because this is still pretty wide, Dave. You know, I'm not going to get right into that tight corner. That's a great question. Corners are always a problem. Uh, I've seen a lot of guys use a lot of different tools, um, little grinders with brushes on them that throw little pieces of wire everywhere. But National has actually had a tool out for a long time that is um, not really well known um, for its value. Mostly polishing guys use it, but a lot of prepping guys would, that are just prepping the floors could see a ton of applications for this. And this tool is called a 3535. And this is a variable speed machine that comes with uh, tons of attachments to solve a ton of problems where you need to prep, but you normally wouldn't be able to get access to. Tom, you want to show us? Uh, I can. I was going to hand this off so that our All guys right, in person can see this. Um, so these different attachments secure to the front of the 3535. And then they've got Velcro on there, so it's going to fit our braised diamonds. It's going to fit our uh, circular polishing pads. Five-inch polishing pads. You know, it's, it's a really great tool because the same tooling that you're going to be using on a Helix or an 8274-4 is also going to work with this. Um, but we also provided these really specialized braised diamonds that are in the shape of a triangle. So you can really get right into those corners and make sure that if you're prepping the floor or if you're polishing the floor, uh, that every single inch of that floor is gonna be the same. And the other attachments that come with it, like a left and right like this, this is great to access behind pipes, behind toilets, behind pillars that are close to the wall, anywhere where you really struggle to get other tools, this just bolts right onto the front of it and it allows that access. So it actually comes with all of these accessories. One thing I like about National is we tend to package things um, so you get the most return on your investment instead of buying a tool and then having to buy 15 other things. Um, you know the old saying, nickel and dime, I hate that. Um, even all the way up to our big ride-on machines, they come with you know, all, all kinds of different swivel head attachments of different lengths and sizes. It comes with some different blades so you can practice with it. Um, gives you an idea what you can accomplish with the machines basically right out of the crate or right out of the box. Um, so we've got three grinders here. Are they all grinders? That's the one. <laughs> this is actually a variable speed um, five inch grinder. Why do I need a variable speed tool? This one's not variable speed, so it's less expensive because there's less to it. This variable speed, I can use it for just standard prep, but I can also, when you order this, it comes with this um, bell with the Velcro on it. So I could actually put five inch um, resin polishing pads and I could polish my edges with this or my stairs or any place that I wanted to blend in. I really like that feature. And obviously, with the polishing pads, I might want to turn it up. I might need to turn it down. So this is one of my favorite tools. It's a little more expensive than the basic 5-inch. But if you're in the polishing world um, and you need to prep in some cases and you need to polish in others, that's definitely um, the 3432 5-inch is definitely my grinder of choice for that. So... Do you guys have any questions? Questions about hand tools? I know they're pretty basic and they've been around a long time, but a lot of versions of them out there. But so you can get them. They start with the braze pad. Oh, repeat the question. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, um, marketing. Um, someone's got to keep me on track. The question was from our audience: Is how many different grits do the pads come in with the triangle braze pads like this? 
um, 50s, 100s, um, all the way down to a super aggressive 16. So everything that you would need to prep or step up into the polishing process. And then you can also get these in um, all the way. resin pads. Yep. So the resins look like this. I've got some somewhere. We could dig one up. Those go, they start at 50. You can do a 50 polishing pad, a 100, a 200, a 400, an 800, a 1500, and a 3000. So technically, if you want to put a little effort into it, I could polish a corner just like the rest of the floor and blend it in pretty good, especially since it has kind of an orbital action instead of a, a rotating action. That's where the guys that have, and, and who, who polishes corners? That's, that's a question I get a lot. Who preps corners? Well, I tell you who polishes corners, the Ferrari dealership, um, the Harley Davidson dealership, these real high end showrooms, they want their monolithic polish to be the same from the center all the way to the edge. They don't want the corners to be less um, aesthetically pleasing as the rest of the floor. Guys that are having problems with um, floors failing from the corners out, um, they definitely want to use these tools to get in to prep those corners. So when they put their whatever kind of coating they're putting down, um, it's going to adhere. Well, I think, it too, a tool like this one, that's a selling point. That's something that you have to market. Um, hey, your other, your other garage guy, they're going to use this type of tool to get into the corner to prep to make sure. I actually use a tool that has the exact same tooling on it as the rest of the tool tools that I'm using as my actual grinders. So I'm going to actually get in there and prep those corners so you're not going to see them fail. And the likelihood of you know, it failing with this other method is significantly greater. So use that to your advantage. You paid for the tool. You got to market it. So I obviously believe that uh, I'm standing here because of, of two big reasons. One, people want to aesthetically make their floors prettier. And two, floors fail because contractors don't do the right prep or the right cleanup. Um, I can't tell you how many floor coverings, it doesn't matter whether it's carpet, ceramic tile, VCT, laminate, an epoxy coating, whatever it is, those fail because guys don't do the right prep. Um, they leave dust on the floor or they don't put a, enough profile on the floor. So I, I don't understand contractors that run out and kind of do a, a halfway job of the prep and hope that it sticks. And then if it doesn't, they'll come back and redo it again. How are you going to make any money that way? It, it b behooves you to do the right prep with the right profile the first time. Because if you don't do it right the first time, how are you ever going to make money if you have to go back and start over and do it again? You can't. Um, that's just, it just, it's just something I think that you guys don't think about the consequences of not doing the right prep the first time. All right, so we're going to – does anybody have any questions online or hanging out here? About, and small tools are pretty easy, but still a touch point that we like to talk about, um, especially the 3535 because I don't think guys see it enough, and I don't think they see the value in it because they don't really realize what it can accomplish. So, all right, ready, Tom, and yep. Lift. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. What's up next? I guess we should roll some scrapers out and talk about them. Can do. Um, let's take our three most popular small space tools out. What do you think? I think that's a good idea. Power hammer trolley. The hey, 550. Quit, quit yelling at us. Just kidding. So particular. And the 5280. Denver's favorite machine. All right, so because we're talking about small spaces, and we're going to start with scrapers, and we're going to keep moving along here. So if your interest isn't in scrapers specifically, um, stick with me. You never know when you might need a tool. Um, when you're bidding a job where before you'd have been like, yeah, I can't do that, or no, I don't want to do that you might learn that uh, there's a real simple way to do it and the versatility of these machines can help you actually do more than one thing. Uh, we're going to start with a 550. This is a national machine that has been around for 
a really long time. It is a small residential tool. If you're going to do 10,000 square feet, um, it's not the right tool. But um, the laundry room, yeah, any small space, bathroom. Uh, any small space. Uh, when I lived in Oklahoma, I lived in the country, kind of out far, and my neighbor was a truck driver. And he came over and he had a hand scraper and he said, hey, Dave, uh, I can't get this uh, VCT off my kitchen floor. I have blisters on my hands. I've been working at it all morning. Don't you do this for a living? And I said, sure. So I unloaded a 550 and a 50-foot 12-gauge cord, threw it over my shoulder, and rolled it <laughs> a thousand yards to his house down the dirt road. And... Uh, he laughed at me and said, I thought you were going to bring over a real machine. And I just smiled and went, I don't tell you how to drive trucks. Let me, let me help you. I just put a self-scoring blade on it, plugged it in, and it took me, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes maybe, and it was done. And he was like, when I shut the machine off, he was like, wow. I just went to Home Depot and bought this tool, and I thought it would work. And I have blisters all over my hands. I should have just come over and asked you this morning this would have been a lot easier. So the 550 is actually a, a really good tool. Um, it's super popular in the rental world. Um, you can find these at um, just about any rental company on the planet. Um, obviously, you can purchase one if you're going to use it on a regular basis. Um, Tom, can you tell us why it's such a portable and easy to use tool? Well, the first part is that it's a compact design. It's got a lot less moving parts, so you do still have a motor up here that's gonna move that blade in what we call a figure eight eccentric motion. So instead of just ramming material off the floor, it's actually gonna cut underneath the material to lift it up off the floor. Um, but typically, like I lived on a second story condo when we first got married, uh, my wife and I, and there was no way I was gonna get one of our bigger walk behinds, even the 5280, up a set of stairs. So this is able to go onto the second story of somebody's home if they've got some ceramics and an upstairs bathroom. Um, a lot of guys love this for roofs, believe it or not. Um, if you put that self-scoring blade on the front like Dave was talking about, you're able to peel up some roof membranes and it's light enough that it's not gonna fall through. Uh, the height is adjustable, and or the pitch, angle, yeah. so that you're able to actually get that blade at the right angle and pitch, so you're able to stay under the machine. You've got a kick plate here in the back so if pushing through and the eccentric motion is not enough, you can actually use your foot to push the machine through the material. And something else that I really like, and this is a question that we get on some of our bigger walk behinds, can it remove hard goods? Um, we typically don't recommend for our 5280 and our 6280 Commander uh, hard good removal because they're just literally not built to take the brunt of that. But the 550, comes or you can actually get a shank to go on the front of it that allows you to do ceramic removal. So I was talking about that bathroom, like the ones in my house that have ceramic on the floor. Um, you know, if somebody chips a tile or my wife gets tired of what's on the floor, uh, then I'm actually able to use the smaller machine um, to get in there and get the job done. So it's really versatile. You're right, so for residential tile, the 550 will take up bathroom, kitchen tile, laundry room tile all day long. Um, that ceramic shank actually really works really well for those removal. And to get it on and off of A to B, that front weight's removable. The handle is removable and height's adjustable. So me and Tom can take that weight off and easily pick it up, and it'll fit in the back of a Dodge Neon. Um, any small car, it'll fit in the trunk. Um, you don't have to have a big truck or you don't have to go rent a truck. I literally can fit this in, the, in, in a trunk of just about any little car or any hatchback for sure. We can just pop it up in there. Um, it's still kind of a two-man lift, but nonetheless, it's super, super portable. Well, you guys out there, Dave and I aren't very tall. You guys are a lot taller than us. Handles height adjustable so that you make sure you're working at the right angle. And let me point out, I'm not very tall, but I make up for it in width, so it all evens out in the end. <laughs> um, okay, so this machine's quiet and portable. Why we're talking about quiet and portable, we're going to talk about portable, and we're not going to talk about quiet. It's <laughs> like, okay, Dave. <laughs> um, and actually, we're going to make touch points on these three, and then we're going to turn them on and run them real quick so 
you guys can kind of get a feel for what we're talking about. Um, our hammer trolley is, uh, is a tool I really like because it works really well. The downside to it is um, it's a jackhammer on wheels, so it's super loud. I mean super loud, you guys. This thing is, is loud, but it works, but it's portable, and it's inexpensive. So if, you're, if you really are going up and down stairs and basements on a daily basis, this is a great little tool. I think it works really well. And we have a Hilti hammer in it. We don't sell the Hilti hammers. We just sell the hammer trolley. But one of the nice things is any bit that Hilti sells for their hammer, you could put on the front of this. I kind of like that. Helps with the versatility. Um, I've got a ceramic bit on it. We could put the VCT um, blade holder and take up some VCT. Um, it is actually height and pitch adjustable. So we can accomplish different removal uh, applications with the different bits by changing our pitch and our angle, which is, is pretty cool. Um, pretty basic, not a lot to it. There's not a lot of breakable parts. Um, I don't know if any of you guys, has anybody here ever used a, a, a jackhammer just by hand? It, it is the worst thing ever. I'd rather kiss my sister and she's ugly. It is not any fun. I've been on tons of jobs where I could, you watch the guys and they'll run this hammer for five minutes and then they set it down. And they walk in circles going. Well, and let's talk I, about labor. Do any of you guys have issues finding labor for jobs, for crews? I mean, I don't know if you do, but every job site I go to, they're looking for good quality people. They're looking for people to stick around and come back the next day. And if you're running a crew and you're not providing them with tools that make their life easier at the end of the day, then they're going to go find somebody who actually is. So, yeah, it's just a jackhammer. But like Dave is saying, if the guy's going to work for five minutes and walk around, you know, he's going to work a lot longer using this. He's going to be happier at the end of the day and, frankly, more productive because they're not taking another smoke break every 15 minutes. I agree with Tom 100%. I cannot find any good help. Oh, hi, <laughs> That's Tom. why you Sorry. have me. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot you were here. Um, okay, so let's step up a little bit. We're still doing small spaces, but we don't want to we don't want to push a little bit machine. Maybe the small spaces got a little bit bigger. Um, let's say you have a lot of carpet or a lot of floor coverings in residential or really like commercial. Um, Nationals made this 5280 for a really long time. And it's a really good machine, but you got to know what you're getting. This is a hydraulic self-propelled 110 volt machine. So it drives itself and it's speed controlled. And I can put flat blades, I can put wing self-scoring blades. Um, I can't put um, shanks for taking up wood floor or ceramic tile because it's not designed for that. Um, it's like trying to pull a giant yacht with a little Ford Ranger pickup. It's a great truck maybe for getting groceries or firewood, but you can pull a 65 foot yacht with it even though it's a truck. So understand its limitations, but it does drive forward and you can manually pull it back. And um, the biggest market we see for this that I see is guys that use a machine 10 times a year and the rest of the time it's sitting in the corner of their shop. So as a price point machine compared to some of our larger machines we're gonna talk about later in this production, these are much more expensive machines with way more features. But if you're only going to use a machine 10 times a year in really small spaces, it doesn't make sense to spend that much money on a larger unit. So this doesn't cost near as much, and it's okay if it sits in the corner of your shop a majority of the year. That way you don't have to struggle. You go to the rental company, oh, yeah, they're all out. They'll be back in three weeks. Well, you need to do your job now. This is a perfect machine for that. It's pretty quiet. It does do most of the work um, itself. I do have to pull it back or turn it, but that's not the end of the world. Um, I see that coming in. I, I know what I'm getting. So remember, this is a soft goods machine. I do warn you guys, though, if you are doing light commercial or commercial and you want to buy this for price point, um, you got to be careful. Don't undersell yourself. If you're using a machine on a really regular basis and you're needing a scraper and you're needing more than just 
a small and expensive machine that you're not using very often, you should probably look at the Commander or the Gladiator. Um, in the past, I have had guys that bought this off price and went, ah, oh, I wish I'd bought a bigger machine. You know, if you hope to buy a 65-foot yacht next year, you probably shouldn't buy a Ford Ranger this year. You should probably go ahead and buy the truck that's going to pull that boat. So don't just buy this off price, but buy it off price if it fits the parameters that is going to give you the ROI that you're looking for. Does that make sense? I mean, I like it, but don't undersell yourself. But if you don't have the budget or the jobs for those bigger, more expensive, heavier machines, this is a great option to have if that's too small for you. So when we say small spaces, that's a, that's a pretty subjective um, terminology. You know, I might think small spaces is a bedroom. You guys might think small spaces is a 2,000 square foot home. So kind of use your own judgment on picking equipment. Um, and that's kind of why we're talking through some of these machines so you can understand production features and benefits so you can see what they'll do for you. And even if you didn't have a use for this today, you never know next year, your business might change a little bit, your model might change a little bit. A GC that you have a great relationship as a contractor might start asking you to take up tons of carpet all the time. And maybe he starts off small and you do a good job and he's like, wow, he showed up on time and he did the job. It all actually ended up in the dumpster. I'm gonna start using this guy more and more. So you might go from just being a grinding guy to you know, a floor covering removal and a grinding guy. You might go from a grinding guy to a polishing guy. So all, all of this is really to benefit you guys to learn more and more about the equipment and it's what it could do for you. Um, we're not here to sell you. I'm, I, we're not, I'm not in sales. I'm, I am. So I'm a training guy. <laughs> so I, I don't care if you buy this machine or this machine. I don't make any more money if you buy a more expensive machine. So normally if I ask you, if you called and said, Dave, I need to buy a walk behind scraper, I'd ask you a whole bunch of questions because I want to know what are you using it for? How big's your jobs? What are you bidding? Are you trying to get bigger? I'll ask a bunch of questions. So hopefully I can get you into the right piece of equipment that's actually going to help you rather than just you telling me what you think you need, which is fine. But sometimes I can steer you in a better direction like I've heard guys say, well, these don't work. They absolutely do work. These are amazing machines. They work really well. Um, obviously, the downside is they're loud. But if you know that going in, someone will tell you that this doesn't work because they want you to buy something bigger, not a national, but just in general. We, we don't play those games here. We actually care about you guys. And believe it or not, we're a small family business that's been around since 1968, and we're not going anywhere. So we want you to buy the right equipment that's gonna do the most for you. Um, we don't want your money once and then run away. We wanna keep you in our loyalty loop. Um, that's why we've been around since 1968. Our philosophy hasn't ever changed and I don't think it ever will. Not as long as it's owned by the owners that have owned it for a really, really long time. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware, but uh, I think Nick, at some point, will you run my phone number across the screen? Um, Nick Stefanski is going to put my contact phone number up. Um, I'm typically available 24 seven. Um, that's a true story. Um, sometimes, um, not recently, obviously, but I fly globally to Asia and Europe and Mexico and a few other places because nationally actually is a global company and I go teach guys, uh, how to run equipment, how to service it and how to sell it all over. So if I'm on an airplane, I'm sure you guys are aware I can't answer my phone on an airplane. That's the exception to the rule. And lately I have not been on a whole lot of airplanes <laughs> um, at all. So if you're working on the 4th of July and your machine is not doing what you need it to or it was doing this and it stops doing that or you're struggling or you have questions or you need help, my phone's always on for you guys. It's never turned off. Uh, somebody called me yesterday at 450 on the East Coast. A uh, guy working in Boston was struggling, and at 4.50 I went, hey, man, hold on. Let me put on some trousers and get a cup of coffee and maybe a smoke going and a Mountain Dew and maybe a Red Bull, and four minutes I'll call you back. But I answered the phone, got dressed. My wife's like, who's calling? I'm like, don't worry. 
it's just IRS. They want money. <laughs> Go back to sleep. <laughs> Went downstairs, popped in the garage, called them right back. But it wouldn't matter if it was 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't care if it's Christmas. Um, typically, in this industry, a lot of you guys go to work when everybody else, when they close the plants at Christmas and Thanksgiving and the 4th of July and Memorial Day, you guys have to go to work. And that's, that's unfortunate or fortunate, depending on, on how you view life. That's just the business you chose. So I'm available. If you call me on Thanksgiving, I'm going to answer my phone. If you call me on Christmas Eve, I'm going to answer my phone. Um, and you guys shouldn't hesitate to reach out because a lot of times it's operator error. And I don't mean that in any negative way, but usually it's something, it's usually not an equipment failure. Sometimes it is, but most of the time, like our ride on machines all have, it's a great example. They have a seat safety switch and George runs it all the time, but George quit last week and they hired Tom. Tom doesn't know it has a seat safety switch. So he has his emergency stop pulled up and he's hitting the green button. It won't start. And everybody's in a panic. Well, nobody told me he has to be sitting on the machine for it to engage. So they call me, and sometimes guys call screaming and swearing. I'm like, whoa, 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 easy. Uh, and I'm going to have to look up that last word because I'm not even sure what it meant. I'm going to have to Google it. Thank you very much. But I ask a few questions, and sometimes they're insulting questions like, are you sitting on it? Usually I get the, hold on. Hey, yeah, I hear some talking in the background. And then I hear the machine start in the background. And then I get the, hey, Dave, I'll call you back. Well, that guy doesn't call me back. Not because it, he doesn't like me, but his machine's running. And now he's been behind schedule because they've been spending, they spend an hour trying to figure out why the machine won't start. And by making a simple phone call to me, he's up and running. That could be true for grinders, shop blasters, all kinds of things. Um, a lot of tools, guys, um, and maybe not. You guys, maybe you're owners, maybe you're a little, maybe you guys graduated from Pepperdine and you're smart. But you're not on the job site and you've hired um, some young kids that are, have great attitudes and strong backs, but they turn on their equipment and it keeps tripping the breaker. So what they've done is they've plugged the vacuum over here and the grinder or the shop blaster over here and it's tripping the breaker. So we'll call me going, this thing keeps tripping the breaker, blah, 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 blah. And the first question I ask is, ah, oh, is it turning off the vacuum too? Yeah, the vacuum shuts off at the same time. Great. You're on the same 20 amp breaker. This is pulling 11 amps or 12 amps. Your vacuum's pulling 12 amps. You're pulling more than 20 amps. So after it runs for a while, it's heating up, shutting off. Get an extension cord, run it on your vac to a different 20 amp breaker. Oh, thanks, Dave. Hang up. They don't call me back. Um, and it's not because you guys didn't know that. Maybe you weren't there. So hopefully your guy has my phone number. He reaches out to me. I can troubleshoot something really quickly. Uh, sorry, left turn on that. But I think that's an important part of this training is understanding uh, service after the sale is super important to national. It, it's something that I hold near and dear. The rest of the world, you call and you get some recording. You can leave a number. They might call you back. They're closed. Our regular business hours are. I bet you there's, I bet you there's 10 guys at National. You could call them at any time of day or night. Didn't matter the day, they'd answer their phone. I'm probably your best phone number just because of my equipment knowledge, and this is all I've done my whole life. But there's tons of guys like Tom answers. I, I, he doesn't ever not answer his phone. And some of us, you know, like, look, if I'm in the swimming pool or doing something, I might not hear my phone ringing, but it doesn't take me very long to come back and go, oh, so I missed a call and return that call. We are here for you guys for the long term, not for the short term. We're not looking for a sale. We're looking for customers for life. And part of that, the only way I think that you can earn that nowadays is the service after the sale. I think it's time to run some machines. Oh, yeah, let's do that. Actually, what do you want to do some. first? Uh, we could probably do the 550 on some VCT. Can do. He might be mad if we take up ceramic tile, but <laughs> he'll get over it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Downhill have on, on the side we have to start on. Sure. Sure.
And you guys can sit all day, or you can jump I was gonna up say, here. I'm not running this. Somebody else has to come up here and run. We'll it. show you how to run it, but don't be shy. Um, and if anybody's watching online, hurry up and get here. Got it. Got it. Is that good enough? Or do you really need us to come down there? Okay. Oh, so he wants to see it coming up. I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go, Tom. Go, go. So By the way, is... this VCT has been here for a while. We drive forklifts on it all the time. We park cars in here. So some guys will go, oh, you're cheating. It's not stuck to the floor. My live audience, please come and touch this and tell me if I'm cheating. There's a lot of glue. If you guys can see on my carpet... I, guys that install don't use that much glue because they're trying to make a buck. We're trying to make sure it's stuck to the floor. We are not cheating. That's nasty. So you can use the kick plate if it's a little tough. And I think one of the great things too what about removing the glue that comes up with this? The angle, the sharpness of my blade has left very little glue, if any, behind. So for guys that are coming through to grind next, why would you want to scrape, uh, re-scrape, uh, use some sort of chemical to get the glue off the floor, then come back and you have to clean it all up, wait for the concrete to dry so that you can gr dry grind. So in one step, I've removed the flooring, adhesive and you're ready to go for your next step anybody want to come touch this machine i know it's a small one but it's fun i promise anyone anyone bueller 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 all right Cannon, come on bueller so i was gonna say you can pull the handles up yeah you're that's maybe. that's really low even for me i also have long monkey arms so Yeah, it's very sticky glue. <laughs> so just turn it on on top. There you go. Just shove it in. Just push push as hard as you can. And and I think one of the other things too on the market, uh, some of our competitors' machines with that ramming motion, when you see demonstration videos by them, they're using a third of the blade half the blade at the most. I don't know if you guys could see it online. I don't know if you saw it here in person. I didn't use a small part of my blade. I shoved the entire blade into the work and it peeled up like butter. Yeah, that's a, that's a super important point that makes Nationals it's scrapers easy. different from those other machines. If you guys think about like a 12 by 12 VCT, if the competition have a, has a 12 inch blade, it's striking that entire 12 inch surface. So that ramming motion obviously creates a lot of wear and tear on the machines and it's loud, but it's not, it's not very effective. Um, with, with our orbital design, it's really the best way to explain is it's cutting in a figure eight. So I'm cutting the top, the bottom, the center, the top, the bottom, the center. So typically when you watch our walk behinds next to somebody else's. It's not that our machines are designed so much different. It's just that that patented orbital action, I'll walk away from them because it's a lot easier for my blade to cut left, right, center, left, right, center, left, right, center, and lift that material rather than striking that entire surface. I have to go a lot, they have to go a lot slower to get the same removal and they can't keep up with me on removal rate. And it's also quieter because it's not, doesn't have that striking motion. Anybody else want to run this? Are we going to graduate in size? We're going to jump up to the 5280. Oh, one more goodie. Or, and you can move it back this way if you want to remove some of this, or you can do whatever you want. Okay. And then, yep, that's your strike plate there. I mean, I know I make things look easy, 
But as you can see, everybody else that's using the machine right now, it's easy. The white, I mean, yeah, it's efficient, it's easy, and there's a reason we still sell a ton of them. Yeah. <laughs> They're noisy, but this one's not. You and I can have a conversation right next to it. So imagine, you know, if we're talking about small spaces, managing expectations, you're in an office, you're removing VCT in the hallway, you've got cubicles right next to you where you're working, or somebody's home, I don't know about you guys uh, with kids, I've got a six month, seven month old at home. She sleeps really well once she's asleep, but if she's not asleep and you were to start using a loud machine like a jackhammer to do some flooring removal, she's gonna wake up. Running this down that hallway or running this in a house to do something, you're not gonna wake anybody up. You're not gonna make anybody miss a phone call or feel like they can't have a conversation. Um, it's quiet, it's simple. There's fantastic, super old marketing pictures before National had a marketing department <laughs> of guys running this, uh, these small machines in, in uh, assistive living or nursing homes with people sitting around playing bingo in the background. And it's a real thing. Um, if you guys uh, would like, would you like to come up and try to take up some VCT with this to see if it's actually stuck? I welcome you to come. I challenge if anybody, if they really think that that VCT is laying there with tile. Um, you can pick these up at any large box store. I hate them, although they do come in handy every once in a while. If there's a little piece stuck, you can just take it and scrape it off. But it is not, uh, it is not the tool that I would want to run all day long. You want that? How long till you quit? Uh, I think in the video I made for marketing, it was three minutes. <laughs> and I wanted nothing to do with it ever again. So the only time this is good is if I actually think these are great to keep around. Because if there's a little piece stuck and you put your machine up, you can just walk it off the floor like there's a little piece there or getting paint off a window if the painter uh drips some paint down the outside of your house but yeah i would never want to remove flooring with that same thing 5280 And if you don't think this glue is sticky, I'm going to my uh, shoes. try not to reenact what I did during the last training where I managed to fall backwards because my shoes glued to the floor. It's actually hilarious. He actually fell backwards. He's just pulling it backwards and then using the uh, hydraulic drive to drive it forward. And this is speed controlled, so if you're popping up over the top of the material, if you're going too fast, you can slow it down. All right. Anybody want to come up and run this guy? You guys make us do all the work. We're gonna cater like really bad food for lunch. I was gonna say I'm just gonna stand here and drink the beer and make everybody else watch. <laughs> yep. So yep. just hit the start button and then squeeze the handle and turn it and up for him a little sorry. bit. Sorry, <laughs> I turned it way down. There you go. And then just pull it back, let go of the handle, and just pull it back. Well, and something too uh, that we haven't touched on yet. National is committed to always building better machines. Uh, Dave mentioned the 5280 has been around a really long time, but that doesn't mean we haven't continued to make it a better machine. Um, this isn't the latest version of this machine, but we've updated the saddle weights. We've added cushioning below them between the saddle weight and the hydraulic tanks so that it makes the machine quieter. We've added uh, things that keep that slide weight from shifting around in transport so that it doesn't hit the overflow valve up here. Those were all things that came from contractors like yourself that were using our machines that said, 
hey Dave, I'm really tired of having to shove a towel in between the machine and the saddle weight. Could you guys do something? And so a lot of those little things, we listen and we make our machines better. So when we're out there in the field and guys tell us something, we actually listen and take it back to the engineers and ask them how we can implement it um, to make a better machine that everybody wants to use. So yeah, this machine's an oldie, but we're still investing some time and energy into it because oh, we- I have to adjust mine. No, 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 you're good. You just gotta turn it the other way. You gotta turn the- you Oh yeah, turn yours it is the... messed up. <laughs> well, that's, we'll just have to adjust that real quick. But I think I yeah, so it is a great machine. Might have to get a crescent wrench. Yeah. I don't right. think that's big enough. Cannon, you got to come up and feel the difference. Hold on, I got to. I know your boss is watching. <laughs> so, just. So, actually, yeah, you just have to clamp down on that to move it forward. And then, yeah, if you turn it counterclockwise or clockwise, yeah, that'll slow it down counterclockwise to speed it up. So, you know, talking about the difference of saving your body, saving some energy. Um, if you're on a, you know, maybe we're talking about small jobs right now, but what if you do medium jobs every once in a while? If it's the difference between the 550 and the 5280, then maybe you invest in something that goes forward. I know a lot of guys that deal with sport, uh, court, well, sport courts and sport coatings like this machine because of the fact that it can pull backwards really fast. Um, okay, okay. But yeah, just because it's an oldie doesn't mean that it doesn't have a place anymore. What kind of uh, maintenance is required on these? Oh, <laughs> that, that's a great question. So Cannon's question is, what kind of maintenance is required on these machines? In all honesty, it's pretty minimal maintenance. Um, you just want to make sure that you keep on the powered machines, the axles um, clean and clear of debris. Um, a lot of times if you're removing carpet, you'll get some carpet threads and shards up in there. Uh, just make sure any of that stuff stays away from it. Um, don't slam the machines down. So earlier, if I was tilting the machine back, you kind of watched me put it down gently. Um, don't let it slam down onto the floor. So there's actual isolators in there. And when you slam the blade head down onto the floor, it actually can overstress those isolators. So it's gonna um, decrease the life of them. It's a replaceable part, but that's something that you wanna watch out for. There's, and, in the wheels, there's needle bearings that are real long. Um, I tell guys, really the, the, the real maintenance for this is about once a year, you should uh, pick it up, take your wheels off, real gently wipe that grease out of there because it does get trash from using it, you know, dust and stuff. Just wipe it out with a rag, like a micro rag. Take some fresh um, white lithium grease, pack it in there, put it back in, go back to work. You, know, you don't have to mess with the hydraulics or anything else. Um, and because you can't really put um, the attachments for hard goods like shanks, your isolators, you're going to run that machine for 10 years before you actually have to do any take tools maintenance to it other than taking the wheels off. I think it's important to take the wheels off. Um, I think I have an example over here. So what Dave is saying is that these machines are really low maintenance. Um, they're designed to be that way. So when you have a job and you're ready for that job, the machine is also ready to go to that job with you. Uh, it's gone. I used to have a big wad of carpet that was all wound up into a ball that I had taken off of um, the inside of one of the wheels. Um, local contractor brought his machine in and said, what do I need to do to this? So I just quick showed him how to, I just picked it up with the forklift and took the wheels off and there was some carpet that had wound up in there. It wasn't hurting anything, but probably not good for the machine. And then I showed him how to wipe it out and, and put some new grease in there and said, you're good to go. Maintenance is done. That took us 15 minutes and we were talking to each other the whole time. So. Are we on?
I don't know about you guys, but I would love to have that outside my office all day long. This, this, this is very effective, but it's very loud and very obnoxious. Um, it reminds me of a girl I dated in high school. Um, <laughs> but it works really good. Uh, uh. I was wondering where you were going there with that one. <laughs> I was just going to. Never mind. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at headquarters. You guys can see it works. It works on ceramic tile. It works on VCT. Um, and obviously, it's super portable. But you, I, don't, I don't know how well it comes through with a camera and the mics, but it's really loud. But if you can get past that, or at least if you know that coming in, that's, that's you know, every machine has its plus and minuses. Um, that's the minus is it's loud, but effective, cost effective. I love these. Um, and if you wanted me to hold this and run it all day, I'd tell you right now, I quit. If I had to do this all day, some good ear muffs, maybe with my ear pods in, little Guns N' Roses, I'd work this thing all day long. So anyone want to come try the Power Hammer, Charlie? Boy, uh, not one at a time, please. <laughs> It, it's pretty it's pretty obnoxious, but you guys can see that it works. That's really the main goal that we want you guys to see is that it's an effective tool. All right. Well, then I think we're done talking about scrapers for small spaces. And Dave, what would you want to do next? Um, we can either move to grinders or shot blasters, or we could talk ha halfway. halfway. Let, let's take, let's take a, a minute to talk about some tooling. Just because we talked about scrapers, I think it's important to understand some of the tooling and the versatility that that tooling creates for you as an end user. Um, the biggest question in small spaces I get is, we should have a bevel up and a bevel down. Yep. You want to explain that? Captain, you're the man. I can do that. Well, and especially for a home environment. So in homes, you typically see either slab on grade or you see a wood subfloor. And slab on grade, bevel up. So you guys can't see it here, I'll pass it around. Um, the actual blade angle is on the top. So it's really gonna get onto that floor. It's not cut myself there. And it's really gonna keep in contact and scrape things off of that cement floor underneath. So, so oh. in the catalog, I, I don't wanna interrupt Tom, but it's kind of confusing. I figured out a, a way for me, maybe it'll help you guys. If you go to order a self-scoring blade and they're bevel up and bevel down, how do you know which one? Bevel down is for upstairs because it's cut so it'll slide across the subfloor. Bevel up is for downstairs. Why is it backwards? I didn't, this was here long before me. <laughs> I wasn't born in 1968. Bevel so, down is for upstairs because the cut is backwards, so it'll slide across the wood floor. So now bevel up is for downstairs. As Dave just said, having the actual angle of the blade on the underside for the bevel down, it's actually gonna slide along that wood subfloor upstairs. And not tear it up. And it's not gonna dig down into it. And I think the question is, is it really that effective? Yeah. Um, I did some it is. thin set removal and some vinyl, glue down vinyl removal at my father-in-law's house. And I used a bevel down blade because even though it wasn't upstairs, it was still a wood subfloor um, over a crawl space. And I was able to <laughs> literally just walk that vinyl off the floor nice and easy. Tom said earlier he has a, a small child at home. I have a 26-year-old and a 21-year-old at home, and he won't trade me. Nope. <laughs> I, also, I remember when I thought diapers were expensive, 
I told him, save your money. Wait till you, wait till you see what's called college tuition. <laughs> I've traded him, but he won't trade. Nope. I think his wife won't trade. So uh, on some of the larger machines, we have what's called um, swivel head attachments, especially for the riders, which helps the, the blade stay in contact with the surface as you're running over materials. That is also available on the smaller walk-behind machines on a bunch of them. And there's two different kinds of, the, of these swivel head attachments. One's a razor blade head attachment, and one's a standard blade attachment. Um, oh, sorry, were you going to hold it for me? Yeah. I'm sorry. It's It'll right. never happen again until next time. <laughs> razor blades come in a pack of 50, and that's exactly what they are, the razor blades. These razor blades are great for taking up glue. Um, so when you order one in the catalog, you get 50, and they come in 8-inch, 12-inch, um, and 4-inch. And I think they come in one a little bit longer than that, and I can't remember right off the top of my head. But these are consumables that you might scrape 100 square feet or so, depending on how smooth the floor is, maybe more. You throw it away. We also make what's called a 1-inch blade. This is not a razor blade. It does not bend. So this is a... 0.094 blade, and that is a 0.045 blade, so that's a very thin razor blade. It's exactly what it says is a razor blade. This is a one-inch blade. Difference. So if you guys have questions, if you're going to order some um, accessories, um, I can walk you through it. Same thing if you don't remember later. What did Dave say? Bevel up, bev bevel down? I, I'm so confused because if you look at the catalog, there's all kinds of different self-scoring blades for different applications. And there, some of them are bubble up, some of them are bubble down. I'll help you walk through it. And I think this is a great time to plug the YouTube channel that our marketing team spent so much time on. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of videos of myself and a lot more videos of Dave that are out there. Uh, but we go over everything about how to use machines, how to do setups for machines, different types of tooling applications. I think there's one where I drone on for 25 minutes about all of our grinder tooling. So if you have trouble sleeping, that's a great one for you. Um, but we really have built a big knowledge database out there so that if you can't get a hold of us or if you do have trouble sleeping, uh, go there, check it out. And uh, I think it's youtube.com slash national flooring equipment. Thank you, Tom. So that's the razor blade. All right, uh, Tom, let's, let's shift to grinders. Blade, so you can see how. Let's shift to uh, grinders. You got it. And then we'll do, if you'll talk about the Ion 1K, and then we'll do shot blasters. How do you think, how do yeah. you feel about that? I like that. So you guys, we don't script this. Um, and we don't, we don't have time to write a big, long script for this. We just kind of make <laughs> it up as we go along. And a lot of times, although you guys are pretty quiet, um, if that's contagious, would you please give it to my wife? Um, oh, she's not watching. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times the questions and guys want to learn more about something specific, it'll shift our training one direction or another, whether it's from chat or whether it's from you guys sitting here. So we don't script it, so we just kind of make it up as we go along, and we're, we're okay with that. Hopefully you guys are okay with that. Um, we're going to talk about grinders, and I, these two grinders are fantastic tools for two reasons. One is... The versatility of tooling that National offers to solve a ton of different problems, which is something that really excites me. I understand w how hard it is to be a contractor and to convince you guys to spend money on something because it's a huge hit. But if you can spend money on something that will give you that return on investment over and over and over and over in lots of different applications, that's where it makes me feel good. I don't feel like I'm selling you something uh, that you don't need. That's why I like both of these machines. The tooling's the same. All of the tooling that you can use go from this machine to this machine. Um, obviously, one's smaller, one's a little bit bigger. Um, Tom, do you want to talk about the Helix, and I'll talk about the 8274-4? Sure. I love, we'll this. I love this machine. I was going to say, we'll switch sides. It's going to be my third wife. Oh my. Uh, so the Helix is our uh, passive planetary machine, but it's also really cool because the main competitor out there in this size of grinder, they either make a passive planetary or they make a direct grind machine. 
the ten inch discs, man, they just they're not. I, I don't. It's not my thing. I've been seeing guys trying to use those ten inch flat discs for years. They ring the floor. They don't drop in. How you get a ten inch disc to drop into the undulations, the the bird bass in the floor? It doesn't work very good. Hey, Tom, will you show us what uh, passive planetary is? It sounds like some weird made up stuff, but because we hear of uh, planetary grinders all the time. What's what's a passive, what's a passive planetary? planetary? How does this help us? So very similar in design that there's a main plate and hubs and the main plate spins in one direction, but on a passive planetary, these hubs are all independent. So they're going to spin. I can spin them in different ways. They're going to follow the path of least resistance as they go over the floor. Exactly. So they're going to get into the highs and lows. They're really going to give a very nice, even uh, profile to prep that concrete. Right now, we've got some diamonds on here. They don't really care what direction they move. But let's yeah. say you're going to be removing a coating or you're going to be trying to cut through some <sighs> adhesive or thin set. You're going to be using some PCDs or some carbides. Oh, it's a directional tool. Small. They have to this move in a very deal. specific direction. So past the planetary, if it follows a path of least resistance, it's not going to happen. Tell With... This, Damn. you're actually able, there's a cotter pin right back up in here. I can pull that pin, pull these hubs off, and attach my directional tooling directly to this plate. And since the plate spins in one direction, it's going to drive those tools through the material that you're trying to remove. So the, if you're using PCDs, polycrystalline diamonds, which are designed to rip thin sets off the floor, or if you're using one-inch carbides that's designed to pull glue off the floor or thick coatings, you want them. You want those tools because they're specific direction tools. You want them mounted to the plate. You, you w they wouldn't work very well here. And so, what's the difference between that and this machine? On this machine, these individual hubs are actually driven by a Kevlar belt, so they also spin only in one direction. So that's why on here, you don't have to remove the hubs in order to get them to spin in one direction to use directional tooling because it's always driven in one direction. So that's a quick overview of passive versus active. Um, Excellent, Tom. There we go. So but, can, uh, I, not, we don't want to sell, sound like a sales pitch, but let's talk a little bit about why this is so popular and wait. why guys are running to national to buy these. They're waiting in line in production because of the design and the features of this, compared to some of those other machines that we were talking about, we're going to kind of touch on a few of those. And they, they actually mean a lot to you as a contractor if you understand what they can do for you. So small spaces. Um, I've got a contractor here in Colorado, runs a couple of our bigger grinders, absolutely loves them, but he got a job for somebody's basement. Not everywhere has basements, but we do here. And so he came and used one of these guys because now he was able to take the machine apart and with the other guy that was working with him on his crew, they were able to carry this down to the basement and do the job that they needed to do. Um, there was no way they were gonna get their thousand pound grinder down there. Um, but this one they could easily carry down. The weights on here are also removable. So there's a lot of different uh, 16 inch attachments out there. Uh, we use a universal hub on the bottom of this. So, you know, I would love for you to use our tooling, but I also get that there's a lot of other great products out there. So talk about versatile. Uh, Dave's used this helix with the weights removed to sand hardwood floors. Um, I hope to try it out on my deck later this summer. Uh, it needs a new coating of stain. Dave just flipped up this little piece right here. So now the helix has turned into an edging tool. I don't know about you guys, but who likes crawling around on their hands and knees on the floor? Um, I don't. <laughs> Spend enough time doing that chasing after my daughter. So being able to flip this up and being able to get right up to that edge enough that it's going to be hid by a cove base, now you've completely demolished the amount of time that you have to spend on your knees and your productivity has gone through the roof. And I actually can lift that shirt up and spin that an edge on the left or the right. So you're able to do that. I think another cool feature, which you can't see at the moment because we don't have her plugged in, um, you've got an LED light on the bottom of this. So not every job site is well lit. Um, so with that light on the back side of this, you're actually able to see the profile 
that you're creating as you're going and doing the work. Um, no one ever reads them, but the safety manuals are right here, easy and accessible. <laughs> and you do have a safety switch or a dead man switch or um, you know, whatever you want to call it. I did a demo down in Texas. The kid thought I was joking because it's a small machine. I said, when you run this machine, you always want to loop this around your wrist. So I handed the machine over to him. He loosely put it around his wrist and then started using the machine while well, he let it fall off of his wrist. And then he went to go do an edge and bumped the machine really hard into the wall and it started to wobble and go crazy. And I had reached over and just ripped it out. And I said, and ladies and gentlemen, that's why even with such a small machine, safety first, keep it wrapped around your wrist. Um, there's the light so you guys can see how well lit it becomes. Handles are collapsible. I'm gonna blind you Dave real quick for transport. Height adjustable up here as well. So if you're tall or short, you're able to adjust for how you wanna do the work. This motor is also a two-speed motor on this model. So um, Tom brought up my, my oldest daughter bought an older house that was built in the 50s and it was her first starter home. And when they moved in, the carpet was, it was bad. I mean, it was not, it was bad. And she decided to pull it up and she called me really excited. Dad, you're never gonna believe it. There's three quarter inch solid oak wood floor underneath this carpet. Why would they have covered it up? I said, because styles change. So she spent weeks and weeks pulling all the staples up by hand with pliers. And she said, can you come help me refinish my wood floor? I'm like, oh, I'm a concrete guy. I'm not a wood floor guy. She's like, it looks horrible. We can't make it any worse. I said, okay. So we have a local distributor. Um, on the bottom of these machines, we, when you buy the machine, you get a five inch um, adapter that you could put your resin pads on or sandpaper pads. Um, I started out doing that and it worked really well, but um, I was changing my pads really quickly. And if you look at the bottom of the helix, it basically looks like a buffer. So I went and bought a uh, buffer attachment that holds 18 inch, 16 inch, 16 inch, 16 inch um, sandpaper discs. And I ran over to Home Depot to the rental department and bought a whole bunch of their 16 inch sanding pads, starting with some probably too aggressive and then kind of sanded it down. And let me tell you guys, for somebody that has been telling people, you can do wood floors with this. I don't know if I believed it or not because I haven't done it. As good as a professional, certainly not. But I took her floor from 1950s, was the last time it was done with who knows how many carpets over it and she stained it kind of a light grayish color. So it didn't really turn the floors gray, but it had that gray tint. It looked amazing. And I did that all with a helix and a vacuum. So talk um, about versatility in a machine. If you've got a customer out there, or if you guys aren't always doing concrete, here's a small machine that maybe it wasn't necessarily designed to do it, but it can do that. So, so it, it's another tool in your toolbox. If you told me you wanted to redo your deck because it was warped and old, I would tell you that it will definitely work for that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the tooling in a minute, but we're going to talk about the two machines that we're going to touch on the tooling, and then we're going to turn them on. And the, why are we going to talk about tooling? Who cares about diamonds? It's not just diamonds. It's, it's the sandpaper pads you could put on it. Um, it's all of the different things. What I always tell guys is with either one of these machines, you could actually do a different job and solve a different problem every day of the week and never slow down all because of the tooling options that Nash National has done a really good job. Really, my engineering department has done a phenomenal job of understanding. Uh, it starts with uh, our marketing, does the voice of the customer. W what do you guys struggle with? What, what, what's your biggest problem? W what do you hate about being a contractor? What's the problems you run into that you just want to run away from, scream and pull your hair out? Um, we, we listen to that and then we try to solve those problems with the equipment and the options that are available for it. 
it's what part of the reason why I really love being here wearing this shirt that says national on it. Um, so we kind of hit all the high spots on the Helix. Let's talk about the 8274-4. This is a planetary grinder. It's true planetary. Like Tom said, it is driven by one um, Kevlar belt. If you break the belt, which is possible, guys, they do the Guns N' Roses and headphones, and they're texting their girlfriend and not paying attention. Yes. The European version is a 220. Um, if you wanted it for the US 220, I'm pretty sure that we could make that available for you. Uh, I'd have to get clarification on that, but we do make we. Yeah, let's do some clarification. The I don't know about Hertz, the Helix. The Hertz requirements in Europe, it's 220, uh, 50, 50. Whereas here we have 220, 60 Hertz. Um, is my understanding, if I remember that right? So. Uh, reach out to us or your distributor or uh, call our home office and uh, we'll hook you up with the right person and then we'll go from there and figure out what we can do for you. So did we repeat the question? Was it available? And okay. This grinder, why is it? This is a super popular grinder in the market. Um, National sells gobs of these because there is not another, nobody makes a 110 volt, variable speed, soft start, planetary machine. All the way up to you guys uh, might be somewhat local. We got some guys from California. What about my guys from the East Coast? Super old buildings, all they have, super old homes. They all still have 15 amp breakers. So what happens when you plug in a machine that's pulling 18 amps? Anybody guess? Anybody do basic math? It trips the breakers is really frustrating. Or this, what about a GFI in the garage? This machine actually has a 15 or 20 amp selector switch. So if I put it on 15, oh, and the Canadians love this because the Canadians only have 15 amp breakers. If I put it on 15, the box goes, oh, you're trying to pull more than 15 amps. It slows the motor down. Keeps it from tripping the breaker. Uh, newer buildings, got a 20 amp plug. I could put it on 20. I get a little more production and not have to worry about the breaker. But if the breakers are an issue, at least I have that option to slow it down and still work without tripping a breaker on 15 amps. All right. And I just went over real quick some of the other things. Soft start. So when I fire this up, fires up real slow. Starts real slow, so it won't trip a breaker, and it's still 110 volt. Um, I could change my direction. So if I'm using diamonds, I can run forward for an hour, and then I can take a break and turn it off and then put it in reverse for an hour. A lot of guys think that uh, that really helps with uh, diamonds wearing evenly. I don't know if I'm a real big believer in that on the smaller machines. On the bigger machines, I see a little value to that. This, if that makes you feel better, you should do that. Me, I just put it on forward and just or reverse. The only time I use forward and reverse is even though um, it's a planetary machine, every grinder pulls to the left or to the right just a little bit. So if I'm coming down the wall backwards, I have it in the direction so it's bumping into the wall the whole time. So I'm not pushing it into the wall. If I'm driving up the wall, I change the direction so it's bumping into the wall this way. So all I'm doing is pushing it forward. I'm not trying to drive it into the wall. That's the main reason why I use the forward and reverse option. I kind of like that because then I'm not working so hard. And the other reason why I change it is if you guys have ever run a grinder, if you hold it real lightly, it's going to push you one way or the other, depending on how it's set up. If it's pushing me this way all day long, at the end of the day, my back right here is going to hurt. So if I switch it at the end of the day, both sides of my back hurt equally. <laughs> it actually doesn't hurt as bad because you are splitting up you know, your, the power that you have available um, in your body, depending on your age and health and physical fitness. Um, the handle's adjustable. I can put two weights down on each side to increase my head pressure, or I could put the weights in the neutral position. Um, it also has a safety breakaway. 
I like this machine just because it's lightweight, it's high production, and it has a ton of features. Uh, the features is what sell this machine for me. Um, the features and all the tooling combined, if uh, I'm a shop lasting guy at heart, but there's the right tool for every job. And just because um, I'm a shop lasting guy from way back, doesn't mean I don't see the value in this for sure. So let's... And just I'll to clarify to real quick, these are dry grinding machines. Yes. So they all have dust extraction ports built into them. Uh, this one comes out on the back. This one's here on the top. So that you're hooking up to a HEPA certified dust collector uh, so that it's pulling out all of the dust um, as you're grinding. Do you want to talk about tooling first or are we doing... Oh, we can so turn we it can on move. and then talk about some tooling. Yeah. We can turn it on here. We can turn it on there. Marketing here? says over there. The real guy in charge behind the camera is telling us over here, so we're going to listen to him. Otherwise, he might replace us. I like my job. I don't want to get replaced. plug us in. I should be able to plug in over there, right? And that one separate, did you say, or one of these? Uh, if you plug it in on the other side over there. Where the there, yellow orange yeah, one is. Where the yellow orange one is, you'll be good. All right. So the tooling that we have on the bottom today is our Super Seg, which is a super soft matrix. So when you look at a diamond, the metal that holds the diamond together is called matrix. It's basically just metal glue. So this is a super soft version of that that has uh, 25 grit diamonds embedded in it. Whoop! fire in the hole. <laughs> so that way um, you're constantly exposing those diamonds. Really good for opening up Hey, Tom, can you tell them why we're using 25 Super Seg, Super Soft, 25 grit diamonds for yeah. a demo? So we have really, really hard concrete here in this warehouse. Uh, the PSI is in here. It's meant to have forklifts driven on it, really heavy equipment. So it's really hard for us to open this concrete. So if we started with a standard 16 grit. Um, like a medium bond. Or a medium bond, it wouldn't do anything. Soft bond, you'd see a little bit more. Um, but the Super Seg tools were designed not to do a full job, but they were designed so that you create a lot of nice scratches into the floor. And because you've created those scratches, then you switch to like your 16 grits, and it makes those 16 grits that much more effective because now they're not having to find a way to open the floor. They catch on those scratches you've already put in and then you're able to actually just keep going with the job. Have you guys ever showed up on a job and the concrete was troweled super, super flat, real shiny and black? It's really hard to get that open with standard medium bond diamonds that most guys are rolling with in their toolbox and their trailer. They do this. So this has been a complaint. With these smaller machines, they only have so much head pressure compared to these, some of these big, huge machines that you may or may not see in the background. So in order to get that to open up, even some garages occasionally, um, I see that real shiny concrete, not very often, but it happens. So as these complaints came in over the years, ah, it's killing me, it's taking forever to open it up. We came up with a single segment, so it has one trapezoid, and it's a super soft, and what that means is that silver glue, which we call matrix, is everybody impressed? I know big words. It's really just the glue. That silver glue wears away quicker which exposes the diamonds faster, which means it cuts faster. So what Tom was saying was exactly what I would do if I showed up and I had to open up this really shiny hard concrete that's here. I put these 25 super segs on and I would just break the surface tension. So I'm not gonna prep with them because they're gonna disappear too fast. They're too expensive for that. I'm just gonna run it and break, break it open a little bit and just kind of start it. And then when I'm done, I would probably in this specific application, because I know this concrete so well, I'd switch to a 16 grit soft bond. So it would have two trapezoids, just a 90, 
9505-16S. Is that right? I'm not a big part number guy. Uh, no, SB. SB, there you go, soft bond. So that's why we're going to run 25 super segs so you guys can see that they actually work really well. Um, this concrete has probably never been ground because we normally put our wood floor here. So we're going to see if we can open it up. And this is real world. If anybody sitting in the background here would like to come and look, this floor uh, here has never been shot blasted. It has never been ground. And it is shiny, hard concrete. I have a Mohs hardness tester if anybody would like to come try it out. Um, the only thing you're going to see here is basically scrape marks. So, so I'm going to turn on the vacuum. We're going to make some noise and we're going to fire this up. So the machine right now is on low speed. And there's glue residue, obviously, all on this floor as well that we're trying to cut off to make it even harder. So I can increase the speed. So you can <laughs> see it still has a nice kick to it. And traditionally, if I was opening up the floor, I wouldn't go this slow. I would probably go more like that. But since we're also just demoing how it grinds as well, I'm going a little bit slower so you guys can see that it has a really consistent scratch pattern. So when we're talking about small spaces versus larger jobs, you guys can see I'm not moving very quickly. And this machine really isn't meant to do very large jobs. But if you're trying to get this into you know, a bathroom because somebody wants a polished floor on a ground floor bathroom or, you know, they want something in a tighter space in a garage. This is a great machine. I even had a guy, he bought one last week and he worried me because he bought one and then told me really what he was doing with it. And he said he was going to be grinding down some high edges. And I was like, oh, please don't do that with the Helix. <laughs> And he went, he bought uh, some of our three great diamonds that go on the bottom of this. And he said it worked like a charm. And it was perfect because he had a small space with high edges that he couldn't get his big grinder into. So even though this really isn't what you want to do to remove, you know, high edges or, or lips in the concrete, he was able to do it and it performed above and beyond his expectations. So, you know, it's a small but mighty machine. Someone else want to run it? Anyone else? You guys, this is a great opportunity to touch a grinder. I mean, even if you're not a grinding guy, at least you can go, yeah, I've run one before. Uh, don't forget your um, safety cord there around your wrist. There you go. Yep. So it also doesn't kick out a lot of dust. Um, pretty standard on a lot of machines now, but the shroud actually floats up and down with the floor. So you're not going to be seeing a lot of dust kicking out of the bottom of the machine. Yep. The goal is a nice, even scratch pattern. So if you're going too fast and you're skipping over spots, you're either going to have to come back with a hand grinder or come back and regrind it again. And you don't want to do that because time's money. 
so maybe you go a little bit slower to start with, but it'll save you time in the long run. Yeah. And because it's a passive planetary machine, it's going to pull you the direction of the concrete. It's really not going to try to pull you one way across the room. Somebody else want to sure. turn it on? Please. Just move it around. You have this whole area to grind. You don't have yeah, to. Yeah, you just don't probably want to get into that real thick glue. You can go over the joint, though, too, if you want. Do we trip the breaker? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoop. As I almost rock it out of your hands. Yep. The, so the diamonds we have on there right now just are just to open it. Yeah. Yep. I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you uh -huh. what I mean by breaking the surface tension with those diamonds. So water test. We'll show you how to do the water test. The dime test. Hey Matt, can we have a bottle of water? So that is a great question. I'm glad you asked the question. The question was, how do I know when I've ground enough, how, when, when, when can I grind? Because I see typically two ends of the, thank you, Matt, mm -hmm. two ends of the spectrum. Guys that don't grind enough, I don't even know why they're bothering, and guys that grind the floor until they're never gonna make any money. And most guys eventually kind of figure out the middle ground. So the easiest way to figure out if you've opened up the concrete enough take a coating or whatever you're going to go back over it with is called the dime test. I did not think I, this is not my test. This has been around for as long as I can remember since I started. That was a long time ago. You guys, I'm almost 50. Take a drop of water, drop it on the floor, drop it on the floor here. I'm sure the camera probably isn't going to show this, but you put a drop of water and after 10 seconds, it should grow as big as a dime, give or take. If you guys look at my drop of water, which I can't see, I'm blind, right there, it's just sitting there. So I have not opened this up at all. Obviously, we have not opened it up. Here you can see it is soaking in. So that means concrete is basically a giant sponge, you guys. It's a giant sponge. So when they finish the concrete, when they trowel it, they put all kinds of curing compounds and finishing additives and blah 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 it's really complicated but it's all disbonding agents and i use the old example i'm glad some of you guys are closer to my age you take your car to earl shy for their 99 dollars paint job you guys remember that they would take a sander and rough up your crappy paint on your crappy car because they'd squirt their cheap paint on there and it would stick if they didn't if they just squirted the paint on if that crappy car would go 70 miles an hour the paint would just come off in sheets Concrete's the same way. If you try to get something to stick to a smooth surface, it's not going to stick. So you really want to open it up. And what I was talking about a little bit ago with these diamonds, when I say break the surface tension, we're prepping with these diamonds. You guys can't afford to do that. They're going to go, Phft. you're going to go, oh, they cost, I don't know what they cost, blah, 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 blah. Ooh, that's costing me a lot of money. But you don't want to put on a medium bond 16 grit diamond and spend three days trying to prep a two-car garage. So you start by doing, I'm gonna show you what I mean by breaking the surface tension.
and that's probably too much. I'm probably overdoing it. And I'm overdoing it just a little bit for the camera, not for you guys standing here. We just need to break it a little bit. And I do the whole area. Stop. Take those diamonds off. They're magnetic. They're super easy to change. Make sure your power is on, you're disconnected from the power supply. Switch your diamonds. They're magnetic. It takes just no time at all to switch them. But that will speed you up. If, if you guys have the right tooling for the prep job and you know how to use them and know when to choose the right kind of tooling, your tooling is going to last longer. You're going to be way more profitable. And you're going to... Why, why are you more profitable? Because your diamonds are lasting like you need them to. So you get your money's worth. Your labor cost goes down because you're getting to the job faster. Because most guys, if... They don't talk to Dave or Tom. They just order some 16 grit medium bond diamonds because that's what the rest of the world does. I can go get a set and we'll just run and run and run and run. It'll eventually break open the surface tension and it'll basically prep it, but it's going to take a really long time. Well, time's the money. I don't care if you own the business and you're going to run this grinder every day. Your, your time is still money. You could move to the next job or be outbidding another job instead of standing here listening to your... Um, Miley Cyrus, uh, uh, and taking forever. Choose the right tooling to get the job done quickly. Um, let's switch the A274. To, does someone else want to run this before we switch? And we also have more time, too, after the session technically yes. ends. We've got a two-hour break for lunch and other demos. So if you guys want to see any of these machines in person run on a different surface, that's what we've set some time aside for you guys to be able to do it. Two hour lunch break, that's awesome. What was that, Nick? 10 minutes? Or so 10 minutes? 25. I was gonna say, I thought we had longer than that, okay. <laughs> uh, I gotcha. Thank you, sir. Now we're gonna run the 8274-4. In theory. This is a little bit heavier machine, and because it is a planetary machine, it's a little more aggressive. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I think it's the same tooling, if I remember. Yep. Uh, well, almost all the same tooling. You've got one that's wrong. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dave. You know, can't take me anywhere. There's a screwdriver over there. If we need <laughs> it was it. like, if you want to see how hard those are stuck on there. Like we said, guys, completely unscripted. <laughs> what I have on there? Uh, it was just a 16 grit. Oh, really? Medium bond. So this is obviously a demo machine. It's probably been out on a bunch of jobs. Um, matter of fact, I think there's a guy standing within. I could throw a rock and hit him. Tested this machine out on a job. Got it. Got it. This is variable speed, typically for diamond grinding. It goes from, I can't remember off the top of my head, we have too many grinders, 400 to about 2000 RPM. My recommendation for grinding with diamond tooling for this machine and my experience has been about three quarters of the way, about 1600. And I always try with one weight down on each side Two weights is usually too much weight. You tend to glaze your diamonds. This is really all you need to do most of the time. If the concrete's real soft, you can put your weights in neutral position. If I was using one inch carbides to take up this glue, I'd probably unbolt the weights and take them off my machine completely just to take as much weight off as possible. So I get the most production and the longest life out of my one inch carbides. So um, we're gonna turn this up to about can you revitalize? So the question was, if a diamond glazes over, how would you revitalize? How do you unglaze that diamond? There's a couple of tricks. The easiest one, if you can get away with it, depending on where you're at, um, take it out on the asphalt if it gets glazed and turn it on on the asphalt and just run it real fast over the asphalt. It will unglaze it immediately because asphalt's really soft. 
that's not always possible and someone might really be upset if you run a grinder on their asphalt, depending on where you're at. The other thing you can do is you can put some water down on the floor, turn off your vacuum, uh, go to your big box store, your Lowe's, your Home Depot, your, your Ace Hardware, whatever. Throw some sand down on that water and fire it up and run over that. Um, and the sand will unglaze it. Some guys are creative. They have battery-powered Dremel tools, and they'll run their Dremel tool with a, a little round belt uh, sandpaper. I've got one in the back I can show you. They'll just grind it off. If your tooling is glazing, you have too much weight down, and you're probably spinning your machine too fast. It's usually one of those two things. Um, the, uh, if I took 16 grit medium bonds and ground right here, I promise you I could glaze my diamonds pretty quickly. But if I had started with the 25 super segs and broke the surface tension, I would never have that problem. That's why having the right tooling is super important. Asking questions, reaching out to us. I'm not here to sell you more diamonds. I'm here to help you get the right tooling to get you the right results as quickly as possible. So um, let's fire this up. Soft start. You guys see the difference in the pattern? See the difference? Because it's a planetary. I've always wanted to do that whole thing to a floor and then clear coat it. Nobody will let me. But do you guys see the production difference? I mean, this is pretty fast, but look how fast this is. So if I was going to break the surface tension with these diamonds, this is all I would do. So I'm at about 1,600. If I turn it up, I'm more likely to glaze my diamonds. If I turn it down like this, I'm not really getting any production. I really need my diamonds cutting. If it was really soft concrete, I might turn my speed down, but I'm more likely to take my weights off. All right, who wants to run this? Want to turn it on touch it for a minute? Anyone? Come on, come on, come on. But you guys see the difference in the production? That's, this Helix is a good machine. Basements, blah, blah, blah. But if I was doing a two-car garage, I'd probably want to step up to this or maybe a GP500 because just my production, just turn, hold on, but turn it on. Make sure you're holding on to it. Takes it a second, but feel it speeding up. It's at about 1,600, about halfway, 1,400, 1,600, somewhere right about there. I never, do, I never turn it all the way up it, unless I'm polishing maybe 1,500, 3,000 because your, your polish really comes from heat and friction. But for grinding, you don't need to go that fast. Can did you, did you want to run this? Here, I'll run your, up. Oh. So just hold on and turn it on. There you go. And you can just grind over this already. It doesn't matter. And it won't grind the glue. You got to stay out of the glue. It's too thick for that. Not the right tooling for that. Um, we got 15 minutes. Let's talk tooling real quick, and then let's go over shot blasting, because I like shot blasters. I love them, and anybody that doesn't like them, they haven't had me teach them how to use them correctly. Um, it's one of my favorite prep tools on the planet. Um, I think it's the fastest, easiest way to profile a surface, because it cleans and profiles in one step. But there's lots of things a shot blaster won't do. It won't take down high spots. It could work a high spot with a grinder. This glue, 
I could put tooling on either one of these grinders we just talked about. I could scrape this glue off and then prep it. Shot blaster, you can't blast glue up. Thin set. The shot blaster won't really take the thin set up. It's not really designed for that. If it's too rough, it won't work. I can put PCDs on here and take up thin set with either one of these grinders. So, well, Dave, then why do you, why, why do you like a shot blaster? There's, there, there's a right tool for every job. If you rolled your car into a mechanic and he had this big, huge toolbox, which is your trucks, and he opens all his drawers up and he pulls out one nine sixteen syringe, he goes, all right, I got my tool, I'm going to fix your car. <laughs> and you went and looked and he didn't have any other tools in his toolbox, you're going to be like, I'm leaving, and you're going to take your car somewhere else. You can't fix everything with one tool. That's why guys have these big trucks and multiple pieces of equipment because if you have the right piece of equipment, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you're going to get the job done faster and more efficient. Um, th you guys see this dust on the ground? It's a disbonding agent. So obviously if you're going to do something, we're going to have to take this vacuum, the DL2000, and it comes with the hose and the wand. And I'm going to have to vacuum this whole floor, and I'm going to have to do a really good job of vacuuming it. Because if I do this, and there's white dust, my coating's not going to stick to that. Some guys go to the extent of vacuuming it and then um, running an auto scrubber. Well, now you're forcing water into the concrete, well, so you have I'm to wait for it to dry. That. But I'm going to show you guys the shop blaster. I'm going to shop blast the floor, and all I'm going to do is maybe run a magnet over it real quick, and the floor is ready for whatever you're going to do to it. How far away can get this? I don't need the adapter because we got 20 yeah. amp plugs here. So we've taken steel shot. We've taken the steel shot and we filled it all up already. I'm pretty sure, have we not, Tom? Yep. Yep. This is what the steel shot looks like. Looks like shot out of a shotgun shell. Do not put this in your shotgun shells and reload because it's a lot harder than l the lead shot that they use in your shotgun. It will destroy your shotgun fairly quickly. Get also, I feel like these are a little bit smaller than the shot that you get in a shotgun. And uh, I don't know about you, but <laughs> I wouldn't really want to eat steel for lunch. So normally, I'd put some shot on the ground and load it, but I'm pretty sure it's actually already I was been... say we might want to try it because we moved it around a little bit and... So we're gonna, on the bottom, there's a magnet in the front, there's a magnet on each side, and nothing in the back, because that's where the air comes in. That shot sticks to those magnets and it creates a curtain. Have you guys ever played with that game at Spencer's they used to have with all the little triangles and you could pull it off of it and make it stand up? That's exactly what this is doing, basically. So what, how does a shot blaster work? Is it has a centrifugal blast wheel in it. Great, Dave, that's not very helpful. Um, Matt, will you show us? It basically has a boat prop in it. And that boat prop is right here. Has big flat blades. Um, Matt Segura is gonna show us what it. I guess this right. is what a blast wheel looks like. You guys see that? If you want to go show the camera, show the camera, and we'll pass it around. And Dave will probably talk in just a moment about the control cage which is this guy, and it basically nestles here into the blast wheel. It is a wear item, and it also has liners inside of it that can wear. But in general, the general rule of thumb is your steel shot as a consumable compared to diamonds. Your co my cost per square foot not including an operator, because you might pay your guy $70 an hour because he's a union guy in Chicago, and he might be in South Texas and pay 
some guys that are just looking for work $5 an hour under the table. I can't control that. I can probably blast for under somewhere between three to five cents a square foot with this machine. That is, that is not very expensive. If you take the repair cost of a grinder and the cost of um, diamond tooling, it's, it, I promise you it's more than that. But Dave, I want a clear coat in my garage. Then you can't use a shot blaster because it's going to leave what we call, we call them cornrows affectionately. Why, why do we call those overlap stripes cornrows? Because historically guys have, they're smart. Um, we have a big roll up door behind me. So all the light when I open that door comes in this way. So if I blast from this wall to that wall and I put too thin of yeah, a coating so down, the liners, you're going to see the stripes. Like if I run them left to right, you might see one or two by the door, but you won't see it all the way across the building. And how does that work? You guys drive down the highway and you look out your window when you're driving through Nebraska and you see corn, that's all you see is corn. It's planted the same direction that you're driving. If you look out your window and you see corn, 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 it's planted this way. Corn, 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 corn. Say that a thousand times fast. That's why guys go left to right if the lights, they're going east to west if the light's coming in from the south of the north. But those overlap lines, because you've blasted an eight inch pattern with this machine, then you overlap it just like when you're mowing the yard. You're not going to underlap it, leave grass real tall. So you've actually blasted that twice. Now I'm pretty good with a blaster. I can make that overlap go little teeny beeny weeny. But I've been doing this my entire life. Most guys that first start, they overlap two inches and then they get down to an inch and maybe half an inch and they're happy with that. But it's really, you can't hide those. So the only place I can think of historically is used to be Old Navy would take a 10 inch shot blaster or a 15 inch shot blaster, I don't remember the spec. And they would literally, when they built the Old Navy stores or when they moved into one, they would start a 10 inch machine right in the middle of the door, the double doors in the front. They'd blast all the way to the back and overlap it in real straight lines all the way to the edge. And then they'd clear coat it because they thought it looked cool. The rest of us went, ooh, <laughs> they did that on purpose because you can see the overlap lines, but they loved it. So Tom's question is absolutely fantastic. If you're gonna put a clear coating, which I don't think a whole lot of people do that. Usually they want a color, but you probably don't want to choose a blaster. But keep in mind, if you put a clear coat over where we diamond grind, you probably have to use a whole bunch of steps with some finer diamonds that are less aggressive to try to hide that, but you're still gonna see some kind of prep mark if you put a clear coat down. So back to how this works, that centrifugal wheel is turning at a very high rate of speed. It is actually propelled by an 8800 RPM Metabo grinder. So just like those grinders we showed earlier, um, they, they work really well for this application. And if they ever do go bad years and years and years down the road, they're inexpensive and easy to replace. Um, when I squeeze these two handles together, it's gonna open a one barrel carburetor. It's called a shot valve. It looks like a, looks like a one barrel carburetor off an old Dodge 318. You know, like a Quadrobog maybe. You guys with me with old Chevys? Oh yeah, you're not with me. So it's a big round ring that opens and closes. The more I squeeze it, the more shot I feed to it, the more I'm doing to the floor. There's guys that wanna talk about different sizes of shot and how that affects the profile. We can have those real fine tune discussions later. Really how fast or how slow I go determines what I'm doing to the floor. If I start this machine and don't move and the blast wheel's spinning, and I open that valve and don't move, I'm gonna dig a hole to China. China gets mad when I do that, but if I go really fast, it's like running the grinder across the floor really fast. It doesn't do anything, it doesn't profile the floor, it's useless. So you gotta just figure it out. I normally tell guys start off too fast and then slow down a little bit. Here we're pretty fortunate, this concrete, like Tom said, it's harder than Hades. Uh, it's hard to get it to do anything for you. Um, polishing it, it takes a long time to do a little section because it's so hard. But you guys are gonna see the difference between grinding and shot blasting on profile, cleanliness, and speed. So I'll give any one of you guys any of the grinders in here and you can, we'll all load up. I'm gonna put this in the back of my F-150 by myself because it weighs 100 pounds. You should get help, it's 100 pounds. I can lift it in the back of the truck by myself. Strong back, weak mind department, I'm top of my class. I'm gonna take my vac, I'm gonna set it up, put it in the back of my truck, couple extension cords, 
a 50 pound bag of shot, a little sweeper magnet, and then you guys load up this big, huge 480 grinder. We'll show up at a two car garage. By the time you guys get your giant machine set up and wired together and blah, 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 and yada, 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 I'm gonna have unloaded this by myself, unloaded the back by myself, hooked it up, and I'll have half of my garage blasted before you ever start. All by myself, in, an, in, in my Ford Ranger pickup, all by myself. One hand tied behind my back. That's why I like <laughs> shop blasting, because in, in that, in, it's just an old dirty garage floor. I'm gonna kill it with this machine, and I'm gonna have my crew putting down on their primer or whatever, just like that. I don't have to worry about it failing. There's no dust on the floor. There's so many impacts per square inch with the shot. I get that, you remember we were talking about the Earl Shy? That mechanical bond, I, I, I say that if you blast the floor and run to Home Depot and, or Lowe's or Menards or Ace Hardware, I try to cover them all, whatever. Go to Walmart, buy a can of $10 uh, linoleum or uh, latex wall paint and you roll it out on the floor good luck getting it off because it soaks into the concrete it grabs on and it's hell getting it off so if you guys are going and buying some really quality epoxy if you want to get your value out of that you better do the prep that'll give you the value out of that coating you're buying or you might as well buy the cheapest stuff there is all right enough talk let's turn it on That's your cord. That's it? Yep. We'll go the other way. I'm running out of cord. I can, we can go. Another thing, you guys see this big hole in the concrete? You know what the grinder's gonna do to that? Pack dust into it. It's not gonna prep it at all. So if there's grease, oil, and dirt in there, you know what it's gonna do? It's still gonna be there and it's gonna make your coating fill. Watch what I can do. I'm winning! So let's talk about cleanup compared to vacuuming and yada, 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 yada. Be you careful that's slippery. Show uh, off an expansion joint? Yeah, we can do that too, but... Um, so I've got a guy here in Denver, and he uh, loves grinding garages. Every, like I said, everybody's got a tool, but he hates cleaning out expansion joints. So he, I demoed this for him. He's like, I like it. I don't know if I really like the cornrows. Like, I really have to be careful. I said, yeah, and you know, we talked about that, but then uh, we ran it over an expansion joint and he got down and looked in there and it was clear and it was profiled. So he was able, because he was able to clean it and profile it and have it ready to accept the filler in one step, instead of having to grind and get down on his knees and do everything. Please, no autographs. I'll be here all week. You can look in there. There's still some goo. Just rocks and stuff. Rocks, but the edges are profiled. The shot doesn't care what it's hitting as long as what it's hitting is concrete. So remember, there's things this tool won't do. But there's some guys here that you want to talk to. Um, they've started franchise businesses. They have these tools and they have grinders. And let me tell y'all, shop blasters are finicky. If you don't know how to make the adjustments to them, it's the same as if my, when a kid start riding bikes, my kids are all old. Five, six, seven, six. Give a six year old a bike and go, good luck and take your 12 pack and go in the house and turn on wrestling. You're not gonna like their bike. You're gonna hate their bike. If you go out and spend a little time with them and teach them to balance and teach them how to ride it, 
they're never giving it up until somebody buys them a dirt bike or a car. Yes? Typically, yes, because that's really... The question is, will the A95 blast a Home Depot Lowe's um, really high-quality epoxy with flakes in it? I'm being kind. I don't know who's watching this ever. I don't want to make any enemies. Yes, it'll take it up. If it's 50 mils of really hard epoxy in a Dana Corporation plant, it's not... It, it, it doesn't hit that hard. You guys have to get a bigger blaster with bigger motors that hit harder to remove really thick coatings. And in some cases, this is I've better you had a scraper. <laughs> yeah, in some cases I've run into even, you know, 20 horsepower 15-inch machines won't take the coating up. I mean, everything has its limitation. But even if you put a grinder on 50 mils of really hard epoxy, it'll take it up, but you're going to make a career out of it. I'd scarify it with TSR teeth first and then clean it up. The right tool for the job. Any other? So who has questions? You guys got to have some kind of questions. Oh, and if uh, you, you get to a job site and there's lots of guys working and they're walking on your floor, um, if you just walk your machine down raised up a little bit, it throws shot everywhere so you shouldn't do this. But if you accidentally lift your machine up, those guys all leave and they don't come back until you're done every single time. It works great. Kind of a question, but what is it's no, no such know, thing. How do you know when you're out of shot, when it's just not profiling the concrete? Pretty much. You're gonna, you're, you'll, you'll be, for me, it's the amp. So the question is, how do you know when you're out of shot? Um, it'll stop blast, you'll stop seeing your profile. But for me, I usually keep a pretty close eye on my amp draw because... I can set this machine to pull 25 amps. I can make my valve open straight up. The more shots you feed to it, the more amps it pulls. Well, I don't want it pulling 25 amps because it's going to trip the breaker. So I try to set my machine, I think this one will set pretty good, around 16 or 17 amps. Why is it not set at 19? Because the hoppers are square and you're going to get some dust in the corners because we, I don't know why we don't make a round hopper. I, uh, I don't know. I can't answer that question. I'm not an engineer. Uh, I don't understand physics, but that dust is actually heavier than the shot and it will collect up. So as it starts to feed through the machine a little bit, like all blasters of every size do, it'll start, it's actually heavier than the shot, believe it or not, because it's like the, if you take a, a Coke bottle, how many marbles can you put in it? You know, compared to how much sand can I put in it? Lots of sand. So it'll actually increase your amp draw. So I keep my valve open where it's only pulling about 16 or 17. So if I get dust in it, it won't exceed that 20 amps because look, I can walk over here and flip my breaker. That's not always the case on job sites. Oh yeah, it's in that closet and the homeowner has something dead bolted on there and he's not there. Or if they're like my mother, they put a bolt lock on it or a padlock yeah. on it. Good luck if she's not and around. And she left to go and to- And she can't find the key because she lost it five years ago. And she's at Costco <laughs> buying coffee and donuts and she won't be back for an hour so you're standing there and your machine doesn't run of course the best way around that is generation um, i'm a big believer in that but it's hard to convince guys of that i hate power because i can't tell you how many times we've showed up on a job site and the guy's got a 230 volt single phase and he asks they've got power and they're standing at the front door knock on the door miss jones opens the door you go, hi miss jones i'm dave and i'm here to grind your garage with my 230 volt single phase grinder and this will plug into your dryer outlet and she looks behind her at her white carpet and she looks at you and your dirty shoes and your dirty cord and she shuts and locks the door and you can hear her on the other side going George your contractors here and they've got dirty cords and I have white carpet this is not gonna you better figure this out look just just bypass all that buy the right generator get that generator um, keep it serviced and you'll Start your job and finish your job without any problems whatsoever. Any more questions? Would you, after going over it with a shot blaster, and say you hit a big area with a, with a, with a window light, uh, would, would you ever go over it with a grinder afterward with a, to take the cornrows out, or is that not really? I think you're just, you're just, the question is, would you blast and then grind? Probably not ever, although I do know that some guys have grinded floors, and because it was hard like this, 
the spec called for a certain um, profile, which we can talk about on a break on, on we, I have comparator chips. If there wasn't quite enough profile for what they wanted, um, they might run a blaster over it to, to create a deeper or heavier profile that's called out by um, an architect or a coding spec. But that doesn't normally happen. If guys know that, the yeah, they, they're going to prepare, because nobody wants to do double the work. And most of the time, the coatings that you're going to put down, you're going to cover it with 10 mils of epoxy or somewhere between 5 and 10. You know, yeah. guys in Florida, guys in along the Gulf Coast, they have, they have really soft concrete they struggle with. Matter of fact, to the point where I've actually seen guys in Florida harden or densify their concrete before they do any prep at all because their grinders just dig into it. Uh, their shop blasters just destroy it. And they're not trying to destroy the concrete. They're trying to protect and preserve it. So they'll literally go in and harden or densify it. Those guys, it's a d little different than you know, majority of the country, it's a specific, and they usually know that, um, and they prepare for that. But most of the time, like in here, I don't know that I could blast hard enough with this machine to not cover it up with a standard coating. I'd have to go really slow, which I could. I could go slow enough to dig a trench in the floor, but this isn't a concrete removal tool. I have guys tell me all the time, I want to buy a shot blaster because I have to take a quarter inch concrete off the floor. I'm like, not the right tool for that. It's not a concrete removal tool, it's a prep tool. If you need to move, remove concrete, they, they make, tools, which I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say it, but they're shave masters. They have diamonds on a drum or a scare fire with teeth that you can dig it up. You, a shop blaster is not a concrete removal tool. Time's up. Oh gosh, time's up. Um, don't want to leave anybody hanging. Well, I think uh, next time we can go over a little bit, but if we're done with that part, then we can probably stop the live stream and let you guys demo the machine unless you want it recorded for perpetuity. So you can show family members back home. I, I can't spell perpetuity, but thank you for using big words, Tom. Anytime. Always uh, <laughs> helping us out. So, all right. Well, then I think if we're going to sign off, um, everybody out there in YouTube and Facebook Live, thank you uh, very much for joining us. Uh, our next session starts in two hours. We're going to be talking about uh, similar machines, but... Uh, in a larger format, and we're going to be talking about medium spaces, and I think that's